So as we continue to build a multiplayer game, we'll need to do several things related to data synchronization, like syncing object properties, or sending and receiving messages in response to events like when players join or leave a game, or when a game starts, and all sorts of other events that happen in a multiplayer game. Mirror's API gives us three ways to do this. The first is callbacks. Mirror provides many callbacks that let us hook into events that happen throughout a game, like when players join or leave, when objects are spawned or destroyed, when the server starts or stops, and all sorts of other things. If we want to hook into more general events, like when clients connect or disconnect, we'd use the callbacks provided by the network manager. And for more specific events happening on a game object level, we'd use the callbacks provided by the network behavior. Mirror also has commands and remote procedure calls, or RPCs, which are basically how we call functions in our code across a network. If we want a client to call a method on the server, we'd use a command. On the other hand, if we want a server to call a method on clients, we'd use RPCs. This is super seamless in Mirror, so that whenever you call a command or RPC, it's almost exactly the same as how you call any other method. And all the serialization and transport level stuff is handled for us under the hood. However, Mirror's API still provides us with a lower level way to send messages directly between clients and the server. This is useful when we need to optimize performance or deal with some really complicated data structures. A lot of people assume that once you go with Mirror, you're locked in and super constrained, but actually it's quite flexible because you always have this option if you want to implement something using lower level primitives. In this video, we'll go over the callbacks, commands, and RPCs. And in a later video, we'll talk about low-level network messages and serialization. You can find all the code on GitHub, and I've linked the project repo below. We also have a community Discord server, so come hang out and feel free to ask any questions there. So, how does Mirror keep track of every networked object in the game? Well, that's where the network identity component comes in. When an object with the network identity on it is spawned, Mirror assigns that network identity a net ID, which is an unsigned integer that Mirror uses when passing messages between the client and server in order to tell which object to send a message to. You have to put a network identity component on every prefab that you spawn at runtime, and this is the reason why. Also, you can see that there is a server only option in the network identity component. If you select this option, then Mirror will only spawn this game object on the server and not any of the clients, which comes in handy in many situations. Before we start passing around data, we need to understand the concept of network authority. So why do we need to know this? Well, we have to be able to tell who's the ultimate source of truth when it comes to the state of any given object so that everyone is on the same page. In Mirror, either the client owns an object or the server owns it. By default, the server owns all objects, but we can hand over authority to a client for things that they need to control, like player input. There's three ways we can give the authority of an object to a client. We can spawn a player object using network server.addPlayer for connection. And in this case, the client associated with that connection is automatically given authority over the player object. We can also give authority to a client when an object is spawned. And here we're just passing in the connection associated with the client when responding this game object using network server.spawn. Lastly, we can give authority to a client by using the assigned client authority method on the network identity class. Here we're calling this method on the network identity of the object we want to hand over authority to, and we're passing in the connection associated with the client. If we want to take away authority of an object from a client, we can use the remove client authority method on the network identity of an object. We can't remove authority from a player object though, so for this case, we would use network server.replace player for connection to replace the player object. All right, so let's run through the callbacks real quick so you just get an idea of what's available, but all of this is in the API reference, so there's no need to memorize any of this. For the network manager, if we wanna write custom code that gets called when these events occur, we would need to create a new script that inherits from network manager. So just keep that in mind for the future. Now on the server, these are the callbacks available to us from the network manager. We have on start server and on server scene changed, which are related to when the server starts or the scene is changed. We have on server connect, on server ready, and on server add player. And these are related to when a client connects and is ready, and also when the player object is spawned. And we have on server disconnect and on stop server, which are related to when a client disconnects and when the server stops. 
On the client, these are the callbacks. So we have on start client, on client connect, on client change scene, and on client scene changed, which are all related to the client starting up and connecting, as well as scene changes. And we also have on stop client and on client disconnect, which are called when the client is stopped or disconnects from the server. So pretty self-explanatory as you can see. Okay, so let's try some of these callbacks out. So I'm using our two cubes project from the first tutorial. Uh, if you don't have this, you can just get it from the GitHub link down below. But there wasn't really much special here, just a simple player prefab with a movement script and a couple other components. And we also had a network manager object with the network manager and network manager HUD components on it. Uh, let's just go ahead and delete this network manager since we're gonna create our own. And under scripts, let's go ahead and create a new c -sharp script and call it my network manager. And let's open that up. Okay, so we're gonna inherit from the default network manager class. So I'll go ahead and import mirror and we'll change this from mono behavior to network manager. And this is what gives us access to all those callbacks that we were just talking about. So let's go ahead and delete everything in here for now. And inside this class, we'll use a few of the callbacks I mentioned earlier just to see how they work and how we can sort of hook into them. So the first one I want to hook into is the on start server callback. And in here we can just say something like server started. We'll also override the on stop server callback and just like the last one we'll just log something simple like server stopped. There were also two other callbacks I wanted to override in this uh, just to see how they work and these were on client connect and on client disconnect. So let's go ahead and override on client connect and this Callback takes in a network connection, which tells us which client has connected to the server. Here I'm just going to log that we've connected to server. And for on client disconnect, we'll do something similar with disconnected from server. All right, so that looks pretty good to me. We have four callbacks that we've overrided here, two related to when the server starts and stops, and two related to when the client connects and disconnects from the server. So let's go back to Unity and try this out. So we'll need to create a empty game object, and I'll rename this to Network Manager. And let's just go ahead and drag in our custom Network Manager script into that. We'll also need the network manager HUD, which gives us those three buttons uh, for hosting, joining as a client, and starting as a server. And let's go ahead and assign this player prefab to the empty player prefab slot. Okay, so I'm gonna use Peril Sync to open two editor windows right here. Um, this was also something that we set up in the first tutorial, so feel free to go back and check that out. But uh, let's just go ahead and under the Peril Sync menu, open up the Clones Manager, and we'll open up the clone in a new editor. Okay, so it's opened up. Uh, let me just quickly drag this to the left. And let's go ahead and hit play on both. Okay, so I'm going to host from the left editor window. So we'll click host and remember that we're acting as a server and the client when we host the game. So before even clicking on this, we should expect to see the message from the on start server callback as well as the on client connect callback. So let's go ahead and hit host. And you can see we've got the server started message down below in the console. And that just indicates that the server started and the on start server callback was called. And we've also got the connected to server message from our on client connect uh, callback that we've overrided. So it seems like everything's working right here. Um, let's go ahead and join this game as a client from the right editor window. And you can see that we've connected to the server. Okay, I'm just gonna hit that we're uh, ready on both clients. And I'm just gonna verify that everything moves around like it did for the first tutorial video. And it does. So let's just go ahead and I'll stop the server. And so we should expect to see the 
server stopped message as well as the disconnect messages. So I'll hit stop host. And you can see we've got the server stopped message here. And on this client in the right editor window, we've got the disconnected from server message, which means that the on client disconnect callback was successful. Anyways, so I hope you can start to see how useful and how much time we can save by having these built in events available to us. And all we really need to do is just respond to them with our own logic. And so this is one of the benefits of going with a high level API like mirror versus building up your networking from scratch and having to implement all of these callbacks yourself. Okay, so for the network behavior, we also have a bunch of built-in callbacks that we can override with our own logic. So there's on start server and on stop server, which are called on the server when a game object is spawned or destroyed on the server. There's on start client and on stop client, which is called on clients when the game object is spawned or destroyed. There's on start local player, which is called on clients for player game objects on the local client only. There's also on start authority and on stop authority, which are called on clients for behaviors that have authority or when authority is removed. Just a quick side note here, we can also create our own custom methods in network behaviors and designate them as server only or client only functions. And the way we can do this is using the server attribute for functions that should only run on the server and the client attribute for functions that should only run on clients. Tagging functions with these attributes is great for readability, but it also serves a purpose, which is that server only functions won't execute on clients. They'll just return immediately and vice versa for client only functions. If a function is called in the wrong scope, mirror will log a warning message in the console. Anyways, so callbacks are great for responding to various lifecycle events that occur in a multiplayer game, but let's talk about actually sending data back and forth between clients and servers. So if we recall from earlier, client authority just means that a client owns an object. Let's say we're a client and we own a player object. This means everyone else has to accept that what we claim about the current state of the player object is the truth. So how do we tell everyone else about the current state of the object we own? Well, we first have to tell the server, which then passes that information on to the other clients. Mirror comes with an easy way to send data from clients to servers using commands. Commands are just methods that are called from clients, but run on the server. It's not possible to call a command from a server since commands only run on the server. They're sent from player objects on the client to player objects on the server, and they can only be sent from our player object. Otherwise, we'd be able to control other player objects, and that's just a security issue. To create a command, all we need to do is add the command attribute to a method in a class inheriting from network behavior. And that's it. This function will now be run on the server when it's called on a client. Everything in between is magically handled for us under the hood, like serializing the parameters and sending them over the network. There are some restrictions though. We can only pass parameters of the following types. The primitive types, so things like bytes, ints, floats, strings, and so on. The built-in Unity math types like Vector3 and Quaternion. Arrays of basic primitive types. Structs containing these allowable types. Network identities and game objects with network identities. If we want to pass in parameters that don't meet these requirements, we'll have to do some manual serialization and stuff like that, but I'll cover all of that in a future video. I'd say 95% of the time, these restrictions shouldn't be a problem for you. Now, you might have been confused about why we can only send commands from our player objects. This actually is not the case. It is possible to invoke commands on non-player objects, but only if the object has client authority or if we set the ignore authority option to true in the command attribute. In this case, commands sent from these objects are run on the server instance of the object, not the player object associated with the client. All right, so let's hop into Unity and try this out. So I'll go back to our player script. We'll just open that up. And in here, let's create a new method called Ola. So it'll return nothing. It'll take nothing in either. And all this method will do is log something to the console. So let's just say received Ola from client. And we'll make this a command by just adding the command attribute right above the method. So this method can now be called on clients, but it'll run on the server. 
So whenever this method is run, we should expect to see received OLA from client in the console for the server. So let's go ahead and make it so that whenever the local player presses down the X key on their keyboard, it calls this command. So in update, we'll check if this is the local player and whether they're pressing down the X key. And we'll just log that we're sending Ola to the server, to server, and we'll call Ola. And that's it, that's how we call a command. We just, you, you couldn't even tell if you didn't see the command itself. So now when all of this runs, if we press down the X key and you know we're the local player, it should log that we're sending Ola to the server on our client. It'll call Ola on the client, and then this method will run on the server and we should expect to see a received OLA from client in the console for the server. So let's go back to Unity and hit play on both editors. I'll go ahead and host from the left editor and join in from the right editor. So let's go ahead and spawn in here. Oh, and it looks like I made a pretty silly mistake. Uh, let's go back and change this to uh, keycode.x, not the string x and back in Unity. So let's go ahead and hit play again. Host from the left editor, join in from the right, spawn in from the left, spawn in on the right. And on the client, I'm just gonna go ahead and hit X. And we can see that we've sent Ola to the server, uh, which just got logged on the client. And then on the server's logs, we can see that we received Ola from the client. So commands are pretty quick and dirty to set up, and trust me, you'll be using them all the time. I know that this was kind of a contrived example, but I think it gets the point across. So we've looked at how functions can be called from the client and run on the server, but what about the other way around, calling functions from the server and having them run on the client? Well, there's two ways we can do this in Mirror. The first is with client RPCs. Client RPC calls are sent from objects on the server to objects on clients. They can be sent from any server object with a network identity that's been spawned already. With client RPC calls, we don't really have to worry about security and authority like we did for commands because the server has authority, so any server object can call a client RPC. Creating a client RPC is as simple as creating a command. All we have to do is add the client RPC attribute to a method, and now this method will be run on clients when it's called on the server. You might be wondering, well, which clients are we running the function on? All of them? Some of them? Well, it depends on who's observing the object according to the object's network visibility. By default, everyone's observing the object, so everyone gets that call. But as you're probably thinking right now, isn't this inefficient? The answer is yes, in some cases. For example, let's say our player has an inventory and we pick up an item. Let's say that information is sent through a client RPC to everyone by the server, but only our inventory gets updated. So if we're the only ones that can see the result of that change to the inventory, since we're the only ones that can open up our inventory and see what's inside, then why is everyone else being sent that information? Isn't that wasteful? Well, yes, it is wasteful, and in this case, the fix is pretty simple, but in general, network visibility can get pretty complicated, and Mirror does have solutions for this, but I'm gonna keep this short for now, and we'll save all of that for a future video. Anyways, client RPCs have the same restriction on parameter data types as commands, but again, nine out of 10 times, it shouldn't be a problem for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and try out client RPCs. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open up the player script again. And in our player class, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new method called too high. And in here, we'll just log that we're too high. And let's go ahead and make this a client RPC. So just to reiterate, this method is called on the server, but it actually runs on clients. And so in update, let's go ahead and check if we're running on the server. And we'll also check if the current position of our object is above a Y level of, let's say, 50. And if that's true, then we'll call too high. So what's going on here is basically whenever our player game object is too high, or I guess above 50 uh, on the Y axis, 
this too high method will be called on the server and run on all clients. And what we should see the too high message being printed out on the console when we actually run this. So let's give this a shot back in Unity. Go ahead and hit play on both editors. And just like before, I'll host on the left editor and join in as a client on the right. I'll just go ahead and ready up so that we're both spawned in. So on the right editor, I'm just going to keep moving up until we get that message. And you can see that's sort of spamming too high and it shouldn't be now. So let's clear it. It looks like we're good. Let's just I'll go into the scene view on the left editor so you can see what's going on. So I'll keep moving up and up and up and up and up. You can see right when we cross that threshold, the messages start popping up. And when we go back down, they stop. So looks like it's clearly working. And again, since we're running as a host on this left editor, yeah, it means that we're running as both the server and the client. So if you're wondering why the messages were showing up on both consoles, uh, that's the reason. So I just want to point out that what we did here is actually really stupid. We should not be calling a client RPC in an update loop like this because we're basically spamming out messages over the network. And this is actually a really bad practice, so I'm just going to go ahead and remove this. But I think you get the overall idea. Okay, so target RPCs are another way that we can call functions from the server and have them run on a client. Unlike client RPCs though, target RPCs are only invoked on one individual target client, not every client. We can turn a function into a target RPC using the target RPC attribute, just like we did for commands and client RPCs. And target RPC functions are called by our code on an object on the server, and then they're invoked on the same object on the client corresponding to the network connection we provide. So if the first parameter of our target RPC method is a network connection object, then the target RPC will be invoked on the client associated with that connection when this function is called on the server. If the first parameter is any other type though, the client that owns the object containing the script with our target RPC will be the one receiving the message. So it's sort of implicit. Now if we go back to our code and try this out ourselves, down below our command, let's go ahead and create a new method called reply Ola. So reply Ola. And in here, we'll just log that we've received Ola from server. And let's go ahead and turn this into a target RPC by adding that attribute. And so what's going on here is that whenever this method is called on the server, it'll be run on the client associated with this object. And we should see received OLA from server printed out on the client. Now what we'll do here is, if you remember from before, we had a OLA command. So basically the client can press down X and say OLA to the server, and the server will print out received OLA from the client. And right below that we'll actually say reply OLA. And so remember the code inside a command is running on the server. So this still fits within our paradigm. And now what's going on here is that when we press on the X key, it should log sending Ola to the server on our client. Then it'll call this Ola command. The code in here will be run on the server. So on the server, we should see a received Ola from client. Then we're calling this target RPC, reply Ola. And the code inside here will be run on the client associated with this object. And we should see received Ola from server on that client's console. So it's sort of like a full loop. We're saying Ola to the server and they're saying Ola back to us. So let's see if this works. So now on the right editor, I'll go ahead and hit X. And you can see we've sent Ola to the server. The server has received Ola from the client and the client has received an Ola from the server. So we've sent something to the server and the server has sort of replied back. And this sort of model of using a command to communicate to a server and then using a target RPC to communicate back to the client that used the command in the first place is something that you'll see pop up all over the place. So I hope this paints a better picture of what commands and RPCs are and how they're sort of used in Mirror.
Anyway, so that covers all the remote actions provided by Mirror. Uh, just to recap, we have commands which are called by a client and run on the server. We have client RPCs which are called by the server and run on all clients. And, you know, there's an asterisk on all since we can configure network visibility and things like that. And finally, we have target RPCs which are called by the server and run on a specific client. Now, calling a function every time you want to send over an update between clients and servers can get pretty tedious. So Mirror comes with a great feature called SyncVars, short for synchronized variables. SyncVars are properties that are synchronized from the server to clients, and they're only available on classes inheriting from network behavior, so keep that in mind. Anyways, when an object is spawned or a player joins a game that's already in progress, Mirror will send over the latest state of all SyncVars on networked objects to them. To create a SyncVar, all we need to do is add the SyncVar attribute to a property, and that's it. The server will now automatically send updates when the value of the SyncVar changes. So we don't need to track anything or manually send over updates using commands or RPCs. Uh, just to reiterate, it only synchronizes from server to client, not the other way around. So if you change the value of a SyncVar on a client, it doesn't get sent to everybody else. It's server to client only, so the server is the source of truth for all SyncVars. A use case that comes up all the time is when a SyncVar changes, we want to know about that change on the client and do something in reaction to that change. For example, uh, in the inventory scenario we talked about earlier, let's say the item in slot 1 changes and we're using a SyncVar to track the item in any given slot. Well, once we get that item update on the client, we might want to render a new icon and display the correct count and name of the new item. So to do that, we'll need to know when the SyncVar changes and act in response to that. We can use the SyncVar hook to tell Mirror to call a custom method that we specify whenever the SyncVar changes value on the client. To do that, we'll need to create a method that takes in two parameters of the same type as the SyncVar, which are the old value of the SyncVar and the new value of the SyncVar. And in the SyncVar attribute, we'll need to specify our custom method as the hook. So let's try this out. Back in the player script, we'll go ahead and create a new property called Ola count and set that to zero initially. And we'll go ahead and make this a sync var. Now inside Ola, we'll go ahead and increment the Ola count by one. And so whenever the client says Ola to the server, uh, this, this value will be updated by the server and it'll be synced back to all the clients because we have this sync var attribute. So on each client, when the old account changes, let's print out the old count and the new count. So to do that, let's go ahead and create a new method here. Call it on old account changed. And it takes in the old count and the new count. And note that these are both integers, just like the sync var up here. And in here, all we'll do is we'll log that we had old count olas, but now we have new count olas. And up where we declared the sync for attribute, we'll just pass in the method we just created on ola count changed as the hook. So just to summarize real quick, whenever we press the X key on a client, It'll call Ola, which then increments the Ola count by one on the server. And then on each client, the hook associated with the sync var will be called on Ola count changed. And it'll be called with the old count and the new count. And we should see this message printed out with the correct values filled in. So let's go back and try this out. All right, so let's hit play. And you can see that we're actually getting a compiler error here saying that we cannot convert method group on all account change to non-delegate type string. And so to fix this, we actually need to specify the name of this method to the hook. And that should fix this issue. So let's go ahead and hit play on both editors. Host from the left, join from the right. Go ahead and ready up. And now when I press X on this client, 
we can see that we have this message. We had zero OLAs, but now we have one OLAs because we sent over a command that increments the OLA account on the server. And since we have that sync for our hook, whenever that change gets propagated to the client, that hook gets called and it prints out the old and the new values. So let's just keep typing that in. And you can see that we're going from three OLAs to four OLAs, then four OLAs to five OLAs. Uh, kind of a silly example, but I think it illustrates the point quite well. Um, but that's it. So now whenever the old account changes on the server, it'll get passed to the client, our hook will get called, and everything's great. So in this tutorial, we've covered the high-level data synchronization features that Mirror provides, and we ran through some simple examples in code to see how it actually works. In a later tutorial, we'll talk about lower-level stuff and get into the nitty-gritty with things like serialization and complex data types. But I hope you enjoyed this part since data synchronization is a core part of building multiplayer games. If you want to hang out or ask any questions, feel free to join our Discord. And if you found this useful, please do drop a like and let me know what else you want me to cover. Thanks for watching and see you next time.